Uh, welcome, everybody, to our final session of this uh, very fruitful conversation we've been having so far about the relevance of the culture of encounter in the first anniversary of Fratelli Tutti. As uh, Thomas Vanchoff indicated in the introduction the first uh, evening yesterday, this is also the launching of a new project of collaboration between the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs of Georgetown University, the Foundation GHR from the United States, and three very important dicasteries or pontifical councils from the Roman Curia, the uh, dicastery for the promotion of integral human development, the Pontifical Council for Culture, and the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. And so part of our task is precisely to work together, to bring the three dicasteries together, to have a global collaboration. How do we translate this culture of encounter into addressing the global challenges, the global agenda, the problems we have today as we come out of the pandemic and as they were so clearly put by Pope Francis in Fratelli Tutti. To have this conversation, we are lucky to have the three secretaries of the three dicasteries or pontifical councils. First of all, I'm very pleased to have with us the secretary of the dicastery for the promotion of integral human development, sister Alessandra Smirelli. For the first time, we have a sister, a religious sister, as the second in command of a curia dicastery. Thank you. We are all very pleased to have you here, and uh, we are hopeful that you will bring some very important things to say to the dicastery. So, Thank you. Sister Alessandra, the secretary of the Pontifical Council for Culture is Bishop Paul Taigi, uh, again an Irish man, and the Irish, as you know, are the best writers of the English language. So I think that is a very proper position for an Irish man to be in charge of uh, the Dicastery for Culture. And uh, the secretary of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, Father Indunil Kodi Tuvaku. <laughs> Kodi Tuvaku, a Sri Lankan from a place in which interreligious dialogue, multi-religious living together, and also conflicts, both coexistence, conviviality between many religions, and conflicts has been part of Sri Lankan life. So let me start with um, a question. How this, uh, our attempt to bring together the message of Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti, how does this inform uh, the work of each of your dicasteries, your task? Thank you. How relevant is Fratelli Tutti for yeah. the promotion of integral human development? Thank you. First of all, thank you. Uh, to Georgetown University and Tom and all of you and uh, La Civiltà Cattolica, Padre Spadaro, for invi inviting me and us to participate in this dialogue. And I think that uh, speaking about the uh, dialogue and the culture of encounter, uh, this is uh, the better way to do this, to put all, all of us together and uh, starting a conversation that can continue after this meeting. And so this is a, uh, you know, Pope Francis likes processes, processes. more than uh, uh, meetings or <laughs> sitting down. So we are here, but uh, we are uh, in, I, I believe we are starting something else. And so thank you for this. And, uh, and sometimes for starting something else, we need to pause, and this is a good moment for doing this. But coming to your question, um, I'm representing the Decastery for uh, the promotion or promoting integral human development. And so, first of all, uh, human development as 
Paolo VI said in uh, the Popularum Progressio, must foster the development of each person and the whole person, we know this. And so the integral approach is one who recognizes the interconnectedness uh, of each person with one another, one another. Uh, and now we can say with the earth that we inhabit and the system, the social system, so Laudato Si and uh, uh, Fratelli Tutti. Uh, we are facing, uh, we are in a moment in which we are facing multiple crises or challenges. The COVID-19 pandemic, the health crisis, but we know uh, the all interrelated, interrelated other crises like uh, economic, environmental, social crisis. And so the idea that uh, lies at the earth of Fratelli Tutti uh, is that we are not experiencing parallel crisis, but uh, one uh, alongside another, but rather one large crisis uh, with various faces uh, that should not and cannot be studied, addressed, understood and faced se in a separate, separately. So uh, we know from the Laudato Si that the cry of the poor and uh, Cardinal Tagle was uh, uh, stressing this point. And the, the cry of the earth uh, are interrelated and they are inseparable from the notion of the common good. And so Fratelli Tutti uh, is for us alongside the Laudato Si and I would say Evangelii Gaudium, these are the three pillars uh, at the basis of our uh, work at the Dicastery. And uh, we have been called by Pope Francis to work in, a, in this way uh, to uh, take on this single crisis in its multiple aspects in order to affirm the dignity of the human being and work towards the uh, common good. And so uh, an integral, as I was saying, approach is the key of our response. For example, coming to our uh, issues, uh, an integral ecology uh, must include both our relationship with nature, but at the same time, our relationship with society. And an integral ecology so is also social and economic. And uh, uh, we can also ask ourselves how the economy should change if we uh, are to maintain together people, relations, society, and nature, the care for our common home. So the culture of encounter is uh, necessarily embedded in our work since we are charged to bring together people and organization from all around the world in collaboration to a shared goals. And uh, I'm going towards the, the end. So um, some practical example. Uh, and I, when you were, sp uh, were speaking, I was reflecting on the fact that we are not starting now at the Decastery one single project without doing it with other uh, people, with other organizations. So, uh, for example, the COVID-19 Commission Pope Francis established in 2020, March 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, and. Uh, Tom Benchos know, knows this because uh, since the beginning is part of uh, this group. The commission uh, is uh, um, made for collaboration because uh, it has five working groups uh, and we are collaborating uh, in the first working group which is devoted to listening, listening the needs, uh, listening from all around the, for, to all around the world. Uh, uh, we, uh, we are working with Caritas Internationalis. The working group two, which is analysis and proposals uh, with five task forces now, uh, economy, ecology, security, Alessio is the coordinator of securities here, um, health and migration. We are working all together, but in each task forces, we have hundreds of partners all around the world, universities, centers, uh, um, organizations, uh, people, 
uh, that are doing something in uh, specific fields, and we are working all together. Uh, the working group three is with the Dicastery for Communication, and working group four with the Secretary of State, uh, and uh, their relationship with states and multilateral organizations. So this is the way Pope Francis established this commission, both to address COVID, asking us to prepare the future, which is different for being prepared for the future, uh, but at the same time to establish a methodology in which we can do something uh, without others. And uh, we have a second process, but uh, maybe we can uh, say something about this uh, later on. And so uh, this is uh, our message. Fratelli Tutti uh, and is at the basis of what we are doing now because uh, we need to address, uh, you know, uh, Fratelli Tutti says everything is connected. Fra uh, sorry, Laudato Si says everything is connected. Fratelli Tutti, everyone is connected. So uh, we put this together and we try to, in our um, what we are doing to help the Pope to spread this message. He has us to be concrete please be concrete, and to help the local churches, uh, to help them to start processes, because now is the time, I think, to act. And so we are helping uh, to start processes. Sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop Paul. So everything is connected, we are all connected. Uh, how this, these central ideas of uh, uh, Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti uh, uh, inform the work you must do at the Pontifical Council for Culture, especially in the dialogue with the secular world. Yeah, I mean, the ancient origins of our council were in post-Vatican II, this idea of having a secretary that would sponsor dialogue with non-believers. And I think that's probably a problematic title because non-believers are more than non-believers. <laughs> they are people with their own belief systems, with their own values, and with their own ideas. Uh, but one of the things, if I can channel my boss, Cardinal Ravazzi, for a moment, we put at the center of everything we do is dialogue. And he's a philologist, and he reminds us that dialogue comes from this idea that logi, there are different ways, different value systems, different worldviews. They are the various logi. And then we need to sponsor conversations across or between or among different ways of understanding the world. And he's also very strong in saying that that dial, also in the original Greek, and I take his word for it, also had a sense of going deeper, trying to get down and find where we really stand on issues, what separates us. What. So dialogue is at the center of everything we do. One mechanism we use for dialogue is the courtyard of the Gentiles, which is responding to an intuition of Pope Benedict when he had been in the Czech Republic and had met with people who would have been seen as distant from religious belief, and yet he found a receptivity and importance of dialogue there. It's to promote discussion, conversation with people who don't identify as being religious. But at the center of those dialogues is never the question of why I believe and why you don't believe, but rather on issues we have to share and we have to confront together because they are issues that define the world and confront us. So those dialogues that happen under the heading of the court of the Gentiles, which are always trying to promote an encounter, meetings, acquaintanceship, friendships, um, between people coming from different starting points, but always focusing on issues that are real and are central for the future of our world. And they're the topics then, we decline those by looking at issues, for example, like um, science and technology. And there, a lot of our work we'll do in conjunction with Sister Alessandra's um, department because they were looking at things like artificial intelligence, there's economic and there's military applications, that's more their competence. There are issues maybe about cultural and political interests that we feel we may have something to say about. And we want to look at issues like strange ones, sport. Because sport is a kind of a common language that different people speak that can be something that is very enriching of human experience in many contexts of our world is probably even more important than religion. And it's a, as a Sunday activity, it has its own value. So how do we see the values of sport speaking a universal language? We find things in common and then how can we work together 
to confront the difficulties that are part of the agenda of sport? Or how can sport promote good human values of understanding? How can the status of celebrities be used to promote good human values? Other areas we look at art and literature because I think storytellers, be that with images or with words, are in some extent saying that it is possible with our imaginations to reach and understand people who seemingly are different from us. So we find a universal, a human, in the diverseness of the stories of different cultures that is a richness. We look at music. So we have a range of areas. I'll just conclude and maybe on two or three things that I think are important that we've learned from that dialogical thing. One is, I think, and this, I think this is very strong in Pope Francis, dialogue is not simply a technique nor a formal procedure. I think dialogue has to begin with a commitment or with an attitude. And in Pope Francis, I think that attitude is to see the other as having something to say, of being a person with dignity, a person of worth. In a world where we're inclined to see the other as a threat or something to be feared or an enemy, we need to begin with this breaking of that barrier. I think the second one, and it came out quite strongly there, is that need for true inclusivity. There's a friend of mine, whenever I ask him how he is, he'll always say, Paul, I can never be any better than my most troubled child. <laughs> and I think that we have that universally as a world. How are we as a humanity? We can never be any better than the position of those who are suffering the most. And final point one is just, we heard the concept, it's a very good that notion, we work and we try to engage with people of goodwill. It's not for us to say who the people of goodwill are. <laughs> I think we need to be conscious and careful to we, we appeal to the goodwill that I think is part of every person. So therefore we try to see diversity and difference and people who would surprise us as dialogue partners of having much to enrich us, to strengthen us. And together then, as we build friendship, we can be more frank, more honest with each other and the sharing becomes deeper and better. Thank you. So Father Indunil, dialogue of course is in the very name of the Pontifical Council for which you are the secretary and so I want you to reflect on the document of human fraternity, but also not only as a text, but the kind of practice that it asks us to uh, uh, entertain. And how do you in the, in the Pontifical Council see this need? I'm going to uh, uh, remind ourselves when Pope Francis visited Sri Lanka, and then he made some disparaging comments about the theologians creating the problems between religions, while ordinary people uh, are able to pray together and, and visit each other's rhymes. So uh, which kind of, uh, how can we bring together precisely the dialogue among religious leaders, but also the dialogue on ordinary believers? Uh, 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 yeah, uh, what does Pope Francis mean, culture of encounter? Father Diego gave the definition of Pope's uh, uh, understanding of interreligious dialogue and dialogue of culture. So here we talk about dialogue of culture. What does culture mean? So culture means our way of living, our way of thinking. Culture has two parts. If culture is a tree, Culture has roots, culture has trunk and the branches. So culture has beliefs that culture's roots, the way we look at, perceive the other, and also, and then how we express these beliefs. So visible culture and invisible culture, what we see is the reflection of the invisible culture. When it comes to interreligious dialogue from the point of view of culture of encounter, what we are trying to do is to touch the roots, the belief system. Because we know the history, official interreligious dialogue started with the Vatican Council too. Before that, we had a negative attitude towards the followers of other religions, that part of our history. And with the Vatican Council too, 
heathens and pagans became followers of the our friends fellow uh, pilgrims and the other religions paganism and heathenism became part of the mystery of god so that change came because of our perception how we perceive the other so roots change when roots changes behavior also changes when our behavior our with the way we think changes then it changes also our conduct our behavior our habits when we change our beliefs and our behavior that also have a positive impact on the others earlier there were polemics conflicts violence and now because of this positive approach others also react positively from the belief level as well as from the behavioral level so when it comes to the document human fraternity and also fratelli tutti we have to take into consideration what is going on in the world also you mentioned about sri lanka i come uh, I, we lived more than 25 years a civil war before that i have seen youth uprising about 30 youths were killed in uh, 1971 and then again i have seen a lot of blood i have heard of a lot of suffering why and then here comes fratelli tutti because the way we look at the other has a problem we don't look at them the problem is there is tribalism and then they say tribalism is in our own dna because being faithful to your own group and aggressive to the others and then we have uh, uh, fraternity means that we go beyond this tribalism so interreligious dialogue of dicasteries and from the vatican council to nothing new as it was rediscovering of how to implement the teaching of the vatican to uh, responding to the uh, contextual needs so here we have everywhere tribalism some countries say we are the first so political tribalism economic tribalism religious tribalism and the response is human fraternity and then how we as the pontifical council have been promoting since the vatican ii so we have dialogue with muslims and then different schools dialogue with buddhists different schools and then with hindus and with sikh taoism confucianism different religions and then our interreligious dialogue also become intrareligious dialogue so we promote fraternity through dialogue that dialogue also promote interreligious dialogue because we invite people belonging to same religion and but belong to to different schools and also our dialogue become ecumenical dialogue let us promote interreligious dialogue ecumenically because we have uh, a very good relationship over 40 years with the world council of churches they are commissioned for interreligious dialogue we have published many documents the latest was healing the wounded humanity a response to the covid and through these things uh, in collaboration with the local churches we try to uh, change the beliefs and thereby uh, the behaviors how we look at others and uh, how others look at us thank you uh you began saying how thanks to pope francis we've again rediscovered this fundamental truth that uh, everything is interconnected relational relationality of persons with persons with creation uh one of the very clear messages of pope francis has been the need to see all these global crises that we are experiencing has been interlinked. 
in precisely coming out of the pandemic. So the global environmental crisis, the global crisis on immigration refugees that we have discussed before, the global crisis of inequality, growing inequality between nations, between countries and within nations, and now the global crisis of the pandemic health. So uh, uh, one of the most striking uh, uh, passages which I read from uh, Fratelli Tutti is when Pope Francis in paragraph seven writes, for all of our hyperconnectivity, we witness a fragmentation that made it more difficult to resolve problems that affect us all. Anyone who thinks that the only lesson to be learned was the need to improve what we were already doing or to refine existing systems of regulations is denying reality. So it calls us to look at global governance which is failing to address these global challenges. And so how can we all contribute? So in which way does this need to see all interconnected forces as all to work together to bring perhaps new aspects of global governance that neither the international system of states nor the global system, economic system, are really are able to address. So some example of what we could do to address this, to bring collaboration, cooperation, to address this crisis together peoples, uh, uh, religions, secular, the arts, everything. So, thank you. So, uh, as a Vatican COVID Commission, we have three words that uh, are inspiring our way of working. Listen, connect, and inspire. And uh, so I think this, and similarly to our C Judge Act, I mean, but uh, we have these two <laughs> ways of uh, addressing issues. And I can tell you some example of what we did, what we are doing, and can be an example for uh, uh, maybe inspire some action. Uh, Pope Francis gave to us three priorities. Food for all, jobs for all, health for all. And uh, for example, we have been working on this issue, uh, um, food for all, accompanying the process of the UN Food System Summit. And uh, we started as uh, is uh, our um, way of working by listening, by trying to understand and listening especially to the poor. We organized some webinars bringing uh, the voices of the most affected of uh, uh, for hunger and uh, problems all around the world. And uh, we put together our messages in the light of this listening. And we, uh, we were in connection with uh, organisms, FAO and UN, um, that were organizing the UN Food System Summit. And with the Secretary of State, uh, first of all, we participated in, the, for example, the Pre-Food System Summit in Rome and Food Summit in uh, New York. But uh, I think the most important thing is that we, uh, building relationship with, with them, uh, doing something together, uh, we said to them, we are at, our, at your disposal if you need something. And we received this message. Please help us to raise our ambition. Because as states, and this was from ambassador, from the organiz organizers, they say, uh, we should represent our, the interests of our countries. We can't do something more, but you can. You can put us all together and asking us to do more. And so I think this is a, a way of addressing these problems, putting the voices of the, the nobody listen from, to them, to ones that can make decisions. And uh, the same is happening for COP26. Uh, on the 4th of October, uh, in a collaboration among us, the Secretary of State and uh, I think other um, institutions, um, the, the, 
people from uh, uh, science and faiths, different faiths, uh, came together to make a commitment uh, for the environment. With different, I mean, there are nuances, the differences among religions, but uh, uh, we were able to make a commitment all together. And we are releasing this message to COP26. 8% of the world population, which means uh, all religions, all faiths represented there at the Vatican, have something to say to COP26. And this is, we made a commitment. Uh, and so we are asking you to do something. And uh, this is the way in which we are uh, working, trying to address again uh, these, uh, these issues. And, um, and from that, we have all around the world, uh, I'm working with the Italian Bishop Conference for the Social Weeks of Catholics. And uh, we, again, we made commitment for our parishes saying we, we are committing ourselves to do that. So leading by example when we can, and uh, trying to, to help the others, to, to help the, the decision makers to raise their ambition. We, uh, and another process we are starting, we, 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 it's a, a demanding project, uh, is a call for action to put Laudato Si in practice, but using the methodology of Fratelli Tutti, the dialogue and the encounter, is the Laudato Si action platform. It's a project for uh, lasting seven years, seven, everyone here I think uh, knows that seven is a biblical number, and uh, so seven years for seven categories of groups, families, uh, um, educational institutions, schools and universities, um, people, uh, the, the business world, uh, but also workers and unions, and um, healthcare centers and services, and uh, so seven groups of people, everyone can fit in uh, one of them. For seven objectives, we call them uh, Laudato Si objectives are kind, are kind of a, sim, a simplified version of the SDGs with a Laudato Si uh, perspectives. And so uh, um, ecological spirituality is one of the objectives, but also ecological uh, economy and uh, ecological education, uh, talking about education. And uh, we are calling everyone to action, to, to register into this platform. Next Sunday, this platform will be open to, to the public and we are collecting uh, pledge and uh, registrations and uh, uh, Georgetown University is uh, leading university on that respect, but also other universities and religious orders and everyone. And uh, the, the aim is to say again, Everyone is trying to do something uh, to improve their way of putting Laudato Si in pra into practice and so that we can show that uh, something can be done. Uh, and uh, this, I think this is the way in which we are trying to do that. Thank you. Uh, uh, Bishop Paul, tomorrow was going to be the start of a plenary assembly of the Pontifical Council for Culture under the heading a necessary humanism. Due to the COVID pandemic, it cannot take place uh, presencially. It's going to be extended over a few weeks. Which kind of humanism is necessary to address all these uh, uh, global challenges we are facing? And how can we bring the different logo that goes into the understanding of what a human person is and what a human family is, uh, so that they all work together, collaborate precisely in addressing those challenges? Yeah. In our plenary, we start with recognizing that a lot of our Christian traditions are coming from that fusion of Hellenistic or classical culture, meeting with the Hebrew biblical cultures, and that has been hugely significant for our um, understanding of what it means to be human. And this is, I think, the base question that keeps emerging in any 
meaningful discussion. I mean, it's in Laudato Si at a certain stage when Pope Francis says, if we ask questions about the future and what sort of planet we want to leave, we're really asking questions about what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to live in community? What does it mean to find value and purpose in life? And where do we find that? And that, if it's to be meaningful, has to go to a global element. We have to recognize the strengths of our own tradition, the humanistic, the understanding of the person we have rooted in our Western tradition, but also opening up and discovering the riches coming from other traditions. And that's part of what we want to do in this, is to see how modern philosophies have something to say to us about what it means to be human. Writers, <laughs> I think, are hugely significant on that. But also on um, exploring more the Eastern traditions and some of the traditions coming from Africa, even at a very simple level, the understanding of what it is to be the relationship between individuality and living in community is somewhat stronger in some, certainly in African culture, that I am because we are. There's a richness of these things. I'm trying to strengthening also and rediscover the important relation, relation, relationality. Um, if I might just make it a bit more concrete, because I think that's the, well, one of the areas where I find this is one of the areas I work on is the area of um, new technologies, digital technologies, and artificial intelligence. And when the church gets involved there, I think what we can bring at times, where we can help is, looking at the United Nations and UNESCO have many good documents on these issues, talking about governance of global governments. But some of the understandings that they run on, on human interdependence, which is, it's more a factual understanding. Well, whether we like it or not, we're in the same world and we have to be tolerant of each other. Whereas I think the Christian message wants to thicken that up and make it more human and make it more compelling. It's not just a question of being forced to cohabit, but we are ultimately brothers and sisters. So how do we bring that into the table and bring that richer understanding? I think the questions we're having to look at, be it issues about the um, ecological crisis we're facing, be it the problems of inequality, be it particularly the challenges coming with new technologies, all of those are going to have to be faced globally. And people from different religious traditions, people from different cultures, people from different political visions are going to have to find some way of discovering together what it is, because everybody in these spheres says we have to be human-centric, we have to put the human person at the center. So what do we mean by the human person? There was an interesting article by Kissinger where he said everybody is talking about wanting to do the right thing be human-centric, but there's 2,000 years of discussion around that. So how do we promote that at the practical level? And that's one, for example, I practically a couple of weeks ago we managed, and this is, I think, where the Vatican has a strength. We have a certain um, privileged kind of importance still in our world. We can bring people together. Recently we did a seminar which we wanted to look on artificial intelligence, and we managed to say, let's get together somebody from the area of new neuroscience, somebody from a technical engineering background, a philosopher, a theologian, a politician, a human rights specialist. And we had our discussion. But what was interesting they were saying is, what we had managed to do was to bring the people from the different areas that they weren't just talking to their own peers, and we were trying to promote something that brings people together. Second relation, on the same topic, is there's been a conversation happening for about five or six years now between some representatives of the Holy See and some representatives of some of the senior industrial operational people in Silicon Valley. And that began with a lot of distrust, a lot of nervousness. But over time, we've learned that to, to see that even the people who are coming from very different positions are themselves struggling to try and see how they can make a difference to the world and make a positive difference to the world. And as the dialogue continues and as the friendship develops, then we're able to be more challenging of each other because we know each other well enough to know that, the, that we can begin to raise questions to each other. So in terms of the future engagement of the church or what we would try to promote in trying to create a global conversation about the issues that matter, I think one is, can we create fora? Can we create moments and occasions where people are free 
to speak without having to defend simply narrow interests. The other thing I think is we need to rediscover, and this is what I appreciate what's happening in this initiative, is rediscover the church, <laughs> that the church is not just Rome. And in fact, most of our departments are very, very small in terms of what the kind of mandates we have. And that we try and discover Rome more as a hub and that we have globally universities and sites of excellence and experts in so many areas that we can bring together and create then a more kind of, um, kind of decentralized understanding of where the strengths of our church lie so that we can engage dialogues at different levels. Father Indunil, you come from Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is in Asia. Asia is the continent of two-thirds of humanity, of millennial civilizations beyond Athens and Jerusalem. And of course, the Federation of Episcopal Conference of Asia, from the very beginning, put dialogue at the center of its mission. Dialogue of religions, dialogue of cultures, and dialogue of peoples, particularly with the poor. So, I want you to just take these points yeah. and bring us what is the Asian perspective where Christianity is, as Cardinal Tagle, Tagle mentioned today, is and is going to be a minority religion. Yeah, the FABC presented, uh, uh, when it defined mission in Asia, triple dialogue, dialogue with uh, religion, interreligious dialogue, dialogue with the poor, liberation, and dialogue with cultures, uh, uh, inculturation. And then uh, I would like to refer to uh, Fratelli Tutti and then uh, formulate my response. In Fratelli Tutti 275, Pope Francis says, room needs, room needs to be made for reflections born of religious traditions that are the repository of centuries of experience and wisdom. For religious classics can prove meaningful in every age. They have an enduring power uh, of open uh, new horizons to stimulate thought, to expand the mind and the heart. And again, 276, he says, reawaken the spiritual energy that can contribute to the betterment of society. So these two numbers, I would like to situate uh, with this uh, axial age concept. Asia has axial age religions. And then Pope Francis also says we need to dream, we need to have hope. We live in a time where there is no hope and there is despair, darkness. And then in the we can we can he says we have to, as he said, reawaken. Religion is there and we need to reawaken them. So uh, Axial age experience gives us some sort of uh, encouragement in different uh, contexts. In um, China, Taoism and uh, Confucianism, and then in Palestine, uh, Hebrew prophets, and then Greece, uh, 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 Plato, Aristotle, and other philosophers. And in uh, India, uh, Siddhartha Gautama Buddha and Upanishad, and also uh, Jainism uh, Mahavira. And these uh, uh, founders of philosophies uh, brought, brought about a new culture. Those axial religions are still with us. The problem is there is always the tension to go back to pre-axial age. So we need reform movements. So Francis of Assisi, a reformer. For Francis speaks of reform. Reform means going back to the essential teaching. So in Asia, we have uh, 
all world religions and then the, there are also issues related to globalization globalization as it operates today we must appreciate its positive aspects as it was said it excludes and the problem is how we manage the excluded of the globalization normally those who are excluded in the global system they react through cultures and also here we have an ideological uh, problem in the sense there is no political ideology after the fall of uh, berlin war to respond to these issues so religion becomes an ideology religion try to fill this vacuum of political idea then religion loses its universality and becomes a particularism so we have religio political parties ethno religious nationalism so this is related to also global justice global given the globalization a human face economy kills pope francis says and then this also we have the response religion is part of the response religion has power to reawaken the humanity and thereby to change the cultures it has done in the past there were reform movements and it can be done there is hope and then how can we do it there are two approaches at intra at extra as it has been said among vatican dicasteries there is a new collaboration enthusiasm earlier we used to work along now there is collaboration we organize we are not for me no we organize a meeting on radicalism there was collaboration uh, with uh, propaganda fide uh, uh, secretary of state ecumenical dialogue and then cop 26 there was collaboration education for uh, interreligious dialogue there is collaboration and then uh, we also when there is ad limina visits bishops bring their problems so we speak to them we help them to reason out and then the fratelli tutti human fraternity comes then when we write messages when uh, other religions celebrate vesak or deepavali we mention about the importance of fratelli tutti we have a journal pro dialogo and there we also mention about the importance so education and then we have conferences we go to different countries and then fratelli tutti human fraternity comes in that way we try to also concrete uh, give uh, uh, implement these things at the grassroots level thank you very much we still have time for a few questions from the audience so please um we welcome you can address a general question to the panel or to specific questions to any of the panelists yes please you will receive now the microphone second so first behind there oh, okay Thank you for this wonderful panel. I am very impressed of having heard and under the chairmanship of uh, a very specially competent uh, uh, Jose Casanova, three persons who are really uh, who represent really uh, I would say dialogue in action because they are uh, on the top of organizations who are working Uh, on on our issue which is so crucial but uh, listening to them i was thinking that the question that come to <laughs> from my heart is this that whilst we are working in such a very inspired way to the this direction direction represented if you want by the motto uh, suggested by sister alessandra you know, listen uh Uh, listen uh, connect inspire no the word in so many 
parts that you are working on are, are, is in, inspired by uh, the opposite thing, so that by the motto which is could be represented like in, instead of listen, connect, inspire by scream, uh, divide, hate. Let's say, look, the situation is this in in, in South Asia. Uh, we have in power someone like in India uh, that whose uh, whose populism is is fed essentially by uh, a rhetoric anti-Islamic, anti anti-difference, anti anti all that is not Hindu. It's a nationalist Hinduism, uh, radicalized, polarized in a way which is uh, giving. Him, support. Don't tell the Pope who has to meet uh, Modi <laughs> quite soon. Don't tell him <laughs> this, but this is reality. But not, not less in Europe, uh, uh, instead of uh, listen, uh, connect, inspire, we have, we have a situation also opposite. Like in, in Europe, in every, practically every European country, uh, we have the situation where the refugees crisis is inspiring and in the opposite sense is feeding uh, populists and demagogues who are uh, working uh, by gathering consent exactly on rejecting refugees, on rejecting uh, immigration. So the question is, <laughs> having, uh, having a work uh, to do, like your work, so uh, against the wind, <laughs> against the wind which is prevailing, uh, how do you think that uh, religious people, re people in charge for uh, having leadership for religious organizations, like could have more influence on the public life, on the on the general opinion. Is that possible? Included, included the the, the, the Anglophone archipel <laughs> from uh, Ireland and Britain. Uh, no one is out of this opposite wind, which is not the wind of dialogue. It's a wind where the differences are feeding, are feeding uh, populism and dem um, demagoguery. So build bridges, not walls, right? Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> no, I think that's very hard. One example that I would give, and I, you hit the one about the, I remember about four or five years ago, the tone of the discussion in Europe about refugees coming towards Europe the language was the language of hordes, of invasions, of people being overrun. And in the middle of that, Pope Francis made a visit to Lesbos and spent time with um, some of the people in the refugee camps, in the migrant camps. And what was extraordinary, I think, what he managed to do was, not so much what he did, but the images showed these children and women and normal, ordinary people that was so far away from the, the enemy that was being portrayed by some public, um, politicians and by some media organizations. In other words, what I think he was able to do was put a face on others, those who we might be afraid of, we might be nervous about, we might be anxious about, and help us to begin to see something of their home and common humanity. So I think you are right, in a context where there is division, it's much easier to play the card of fear and hatred. It's a far easier card to play it, and it impacts people more immediately. But what our challenge is never to descend to that level, to try and appeal to that that is within all human beings. Because part of our Christian tradition, not uniquely Christian, is a belief that people are made in the image and likeness of God. They are made, ultimately, for communion. And if we can free them, they discover their true nature in that responding with generosity and not with fear towards those who are different. And I think that's, and I think difficult as it may seem, we know that the ultimate truth is that people deep down know that we are brothers and sisters. That, that's somehow written into our psychological and anthropological DNA. I mean, uh, thank you very much for your question. It is true that we often hear these negative things. This is the dominant narrative. I come from Sri Lanka. We had the Sinhala Buddhist, uh, what he call an uh, uh, Tamil conflict. 
I, our next door neighbors are Muslims. We have third generation, very good relationship. And then often we hear in the media the dominant narrative. There are other narratives. And it is up to us to bring to the surface these narratives that are on the periphery. They are narratives lived by simple, ordinary people. They go counter to this dominant narrative. I have many lived experience from the school time, mixed school, Buddhist, Hindus, Christians, conviviality with them. My mother, when my mother died, our next door neighbor Muslim, two girls cried more than my nephews and nieces. So, I mean, we open, okay, Muslims and Christians are conflict. But there are other narratives. Second one is also symbolic language. Pope's visit to Iraq. Nobody over talking about and then this particular document, human fraternity, clash of civilization. This is a dominant narrative. But here we have a counter narrative. Instead of clash of civilization, cultures, we have culture of respect, culture of inclusion. And Pope's visit to Iraq was dialogue, ecumenical dialogue, dialogue among Christians and interreligious dialogue and dialogue among politicians, triple dialogue. He went there and gave the world a lesson. Everything is possible with dialogue. Then the ACC experience. There were wars. And then Pope John Paul's response, there is another response to the violence, that is prayer, a counter-narrative. I think we need to narrate these counter-narratives. Yes, thank you, please. So, Jason no. Bale from Pisa. No. He was the first one, actually. Yes. Thank you. Uh, no, my question would be uh, in this direction. Just turning back again, you know, the roots, and just I'm so much inspired by the Cardinal, uh, to Nostra Etate, number three, and inviting, uh, it's an interesting document for me because as a Muslim, I just, when I discovered this is the document, not only uh, addressing Catholics, but the Muslims too, because it, it invites everybody to promote these four areas, that's my question. And these four areas, social justice, peace, freedom, and moral values, and pro omnibus homonibus, not for Muslims, Christians, or for everyone, all the human beings. And since the session is about the future of dialogue, and uh, yesterday, Cardinal Ayuso reminding us about the from face to face, from to shoulder, shoulder to shoulder, and uh, are there uh, any concrete projects uh, that you can just, you know, mention to us, you know, from your experience that not only Muslims, Christians, but people from different religions join together as uh, believers, you know, to promote these uh, fields that were actually a prospect for the future already in 1965. If uh, there aren't, you know, uh, how would you see the prospect about the dialogue going into the uh, joint concrete projects? Thank you. Said something about COP. So say that you've said already. <laughs> the sister is saying, well, that's what I was saying before. Yeah, no, I said something examples. about uh, COP26 as a concrete example. And uh, I think uh, thanks to the uh, network of uh, ambassadors uh, to the Holy See, uh, that they represent uh, a country, uh, but uh, to, with this perspective, uh, faith perspectives, I mean, only see. But uh, they are also part of they, their government. And, and so uh, sometimes they are helping us to bring at the table, to the table, uh, different uh, 
people, not necessarily, necessarily they are believers, but we organize meeting, not always open meeting. As uh, Bishop Paul Teig was saying, uh, sometimes we just allow to have free spaces, and in these spaces of dialogue, uh, some projects can uh, start, can begin, and maybe then they become something more open. And uh, so the um, environment and ecology issues are uh, an issue that uh, are bringing together people from all around the world, but, uh, uh, and all faiths, uh, no matters, but uh, they are uh, concerned about doing something for this and uh, there are work in progresses on that. But Alessio has a project on uh, peace, security, and he is bringing together, uh, again, experts and people from all around the world to build processes uh, on this. Uh, and um, so um, sometimes, and going back to the previous questions, there are uh, processes that are not making noise, I mean, they are not, uh, because uh, as a, the, I mean, life, you need at the beginning a space uh, uh, for uh, letting things grow in, and then you can uh, um, be open and uh, maybe communicate something. And uh, when Pope Francis met the coordinators of the Vatican COVID Commission last year, this year, in March, uh, he said, uh, you should be as the fertile soil that allows plants to grow. So this is our um, mission, I mean. Bishop Paul, you would like to add something? Yeah, I just think, I'd love to to see chapter five where the Pope sets out the actions that are required and each of the heading is dialogue, international dialogue, national dialogue. So dialogue is absolutely essential. I think one of the things when we try to engage with dialogue, we can take the learnings we've had already from ecumenical and into religious dialogue and bring that into a broader. So from the ecumenical, there's a lovely phrase of Justin Welby where he says we have to have receptive ecumenism a receptive dialogue. I start with recognizing what's lacking in my tradition and what I need to learn from other people, not just what I can bring. The other one is one from Jonathan Sachs in Britain, who's been very strong in trying to promote um, dialogue across religions and within religions and with society, where he makes a point, which I think is very important about the difference between narrow casting and broadcasting. Narrow casting is when I'm speaking to my own people and I can use all my own favorite language and they respond to it. But he says, broadcast, but I want to really engage and speak to people from different backgrounds, means sometimes I have to abandon my lovely favorite language that I speak very fluently and try and learn another language that is more inclusive and that is more accessible and more understandable to people. So I think from our history already of ecumenical and interreligious dialogue, we have things that will help us to enrich a broader dialogue. And to be, one final point I'd be, forgive my Irishness here, but being incremental. Very often we have to not rush, we need to sow, create the soil, tend the garden. Northern Ireland, which is a very fragile peace process, but which has seen some real progress, began with what we call proximity talks. If we could get the two people into the same building, we would never get them into the same room to begin. But we can begin to have proximity talk and somebody running the tree to build the trust that leads to better things. So I think there are some points we have already learned. Thank you very much for referring to the document, a Milestone in Interreligious Dialogue, Nostra Etate. Nostra Etate says it is not possible call on God, the Father of all, if we refuse to treat in a brotherly or sisterly way any man or woman created as he or she in the image of God. Number five. Again, it says, Church reproves as foreign to the mind of Christ any discrimination against men and women or harassment of them because of their race, color, 
condition of life or religion we talk about after 55 years of nosrai taate but we see these elements are still happening in our society and then when it comes to we have dialogue with muslims we have dialogue with uh, buddhism hinduism and then what are the new things that we can do we have already started dialogue with uh, taoist two dialogues that we wanted to have but uh, pandemic came and then we are also thinking of having a dialogue with confucianism officially our dicastery and we are working on now to publish two guidelines guideline to dialogue with taoist guideline to dialogue with uh, confucians confucianism because as i said belief system is important roots then people know what it means to dialogue with these groups then pope also continuously speaking importance of dialogue and women we had plenary assembly on interreligious dialogue and women then uh, we are in touch with world union of catholic women we have a series of dialogue and then we organize uh, 2019 buddhist and christian nuns uh, in dialogue about 70 participants in collaboration with intermonastic dialogue from 17 countries in a buddhist monastery in taiwan hogan shan and these are some new things that we are planning to do yeah so the last question from our front no uh well then only to thank you for the panelists and thank everybody for participating in this very very important conversation this very important dialogue thank you to civita catolica and to the berkeley center for religious peace and world affairs for bringing all of us together and uh, thank you thank you <laughs>